couple things I want to say before I talk about that video and what we're going to do. Um, so my wife could have a baby now at any moment. So Chrissy's got my, my phone. If it goes off, then short service. What can I tell you? Um, <laughs> I, uh, it's good to be back. I was in New York City area last week uh, speaking at a church there, and uh, uh, I got to tell you, they sent me a uh, dress code because, um, you know, East Coast, that kind of thing, they like to be presentable, and they told me, we've seen your videos, you can't wear what you normally wear. <laughs> so they sent me like the J. Crew catalog, and I, I got it straightened out. Um, so one day I'll wear here what I wore there last week, and uh, it was all going well in my J. Crew until I said that uh, when I checked in with Kara on Saturday night, she, she told me that she was six meters dial, or, uh, two meters dilated. And uh, yeah, two centimeters dilated. <laughs> so I, I said that, and uh, after that first service, I was going to the bathroom, and a guy comes up, he goes, hey, you know you said everybody, to everybody that your wife was six, six uh, meter, two meters uh, dilated, you know, and I said, I probably did, and he goes, well, you know what, it was pretty funny, so, uh, so we had that, um, and this church, they uh, did not take an offering, and they did not hand out bulletins, which I thought was uh, kind of interesting, so I know some of you are like, you know, what are these little white things we folded three times all about, at least you have something, okay, so they, they have nothing in New York, they're saving the trees back there, so, so this week, um, we started a new series called Jesus Encounters, and we showed that uh, Carolina Liar video called uh, Show Me What I'm Looking For, because that is the heart's cry of so many people. Show me, Lord, what I'm, I'm looking for. Uh, save me uh, somehow. Um, what the, the cry of, of the soul is to find hope and peace, and whatever people are turning to to find hope and peace for their soul, they're doing it to soothe the, the ache and the fear and the anxiety and that growing sense of hopelessness that they feel. And, and every one of us, no matter what the state of our soul is, as we sit here this morning, we all have one thing in common. We all have an, an innate sense that there is more and better life to be lived than the life that we are living now. There's more and better life to be lived than the life that we've, we've settled for. Ecclesiastes 3.11 says that God has planted eternity in the human heart. We were created to know more, to experience more. And whatever we're turning to in order to fill the ache or uh, dull the pain or escape the emptiness, all that stuff just leaves us wanting, leaves us hurting, in some cases even more. What we're really longing to experience is a profound encounter with Jesus a connection with a God that planted eternity in our hearts. Blaise Pascal is attributed, this quote is attributed to him, uh, says that there is a God-shaped vacuum, and we've used this before, there's a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of every person which cannot be filled by any created thing, but only by God, the creator, made known through Jesus. So show me what I'm looking for, it's this. To fill the void, it's a relationship with Jesus, with God through Jesus. How many of us, even if we've been church-going people for a number of years, how many of us uh, are sitting here uh, truly and desperately longing to connect with something and live a life more meaningful than the life that we're currently living? How many of us know what it's like to live in intimate proximity to Jesus but aren't living there now? How many of us are just living where we can see Jesus. He's far enough away so we can see him. We can even hear a little bit from him, but we won't allow him to touch our lives because we don't want him to mess with it. How many of us are living there? Yet our souls long for that close proximity to Jesus, close enough to where we uh, understand and experience his tenderness and his, the love that he has for us, uh, the heart that he has for us. So in John chapter 8, a woman whose name you and I will never know has a profound encounter with, with Jesus. This is from the message, John 8, verse 1. Just when, uh, Jesus went across to Mount Olives, but he was soon back in the temple again. Swarms of people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. The religion scholars and Pharisees led in a woman who had been caught in, in, the act of, in, in an act of adultery. 
they stood her in plain sight of everyone. So of all the people in the crowd that day, the only one who knew and cared about this woman, the only one who knew this woman's name was Jesus. This woman was being used by the Pharisee as a pawn in the big chess game they were playing with Jesus, trying to trap him. They wanted to trap Jesus in such a way that they could uh, discredit him. And so this woman was a very little consequence to the Pharisees. Her life was worth nothing to them. But Jesus knows this woman's name and her life is everything to him. Jesus not only knew her name that day, he, has al he always knew her name. Just like he's always known your name and mine. Just like he's he cared for the details, like it says in Psalm 37, 23. He cared about the details in this lady's life. Just as he cares about the details in your life and mine. In fact, it says he delights in the details of our lives. So this woman's life... Um, the Pharisees were just willing to sacrifice in order to trap Jesus. And this woman is said to have been caught in the very act of adultery. Yet she's out there alone. In this religious culture, the law clearly states that anyone caught in or guilty of adultery should be killed. And in this case, she would be killed by stoning her to death. But instead of being stoned to death, something beautiful, something powerful happens to this desperate and hopeless woman who is about to come face to face with death. She comes face to face with Jesus and everything changes. He gives her life. How many of us need desperately to come face to face with Jesus today? Even if we won't tell anybody, in the depths of our soul, one thing that's true that we realize is that we need to come face to face, face with Jesus. We need to enter in for the first time or re-enter that place of living in close proximity to Jesus. Because that's where our soul finds life. That's where our soul finds what it's looking for. So this, uh, this woman, she's in trouble. Um, the Pharisees say in verse four, teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the very act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her, what do you say? So they're trying to trap him. It says they were trying to trap him, him into saying something they could use against him. Again, we see large crowds converging on Jesus um, as he teaches in the temple courts. Jesus now, though, is in one of the outer courts. He's in the court of women, which tells us a lot about Jesus' heart. It tells us a lot about who Jesus cared for the most. He could have gone in closer to the Holy of Holies. He could have gone in closer to the high priest. But he stayed out where, in, the, in the court where everybody could go, including women, especially women. And he was accessible to everybody. But again, Jesus teaching is interrupted, but this time he's interrupted, uh, his teaching was interrupted a lot by people who would not let a large crowd dissuade them from getting to Jesus, but usually they wanted healing or a word from Jesus or something that only Jesus could provide. This particular group of people, their motives for getting to Jesus were different. Their motives were to involve Jesus, Jesus in carrying out a death sentence for this woman caught in the very act of adultery. The Pharisees truly believed they, that they had uh, Jesus caught this time. This was the ultimate trap. Jesus had no option here but to fail and fall into their trap. If Jesus gives assent to the stoning of this woman, then he's giving assent to the law of Moses, and he would no longer be known as a friend of sinners, as one who forgives no matter what the offense. And he would hopefully, in the Pharisees' eyes, drift into insignificance. And if Jesus contradicts the law, then the Pharisees would get a two-for-one stoning. They would stone the woman for adultery, and they would stone Jesus for blasphemy. Luke 2.22 says, The leading priests and teachers of religious law were actively plotting Jesus' murder, but they wanted to kill him without starting a riot, a possibility they great, greatly feared. So they wanted Jesus to kind of be responsible for what, what they did. They didn't want to be responsible on their own. So they tried to trick him and trap him. The Pharisees, man, they must have stayed up all night to work on this awesome scheme. They would, 
you know, they believed totally that they had Jesus pinned against the wall. No matter how he responds, it's bad for the woman. No matter how he responds, it's bad for him and great for the Pharisees. And then the hands of the Pharisees would have no blood on them. The blood would be on Jesus' hands because they were just following the letter of the law. They were just doing what they were supposed to do. So Jesus' refer first response to this woman's accusers when they asked him, you know, what do you think we should do? The law says we should stone her, is that he stooped down and started writing in the ground, which frustrated these guys. One theologian suggests that Jesus, Jesus stooped to the ground because his heart was broken over what he was, he was seeing and what was, and what was unfolding in front of him. It just pierced his heart to the point where he went to his knees and began to write in the ground. His heart was broken, according to this idea, this theologian, so much that he couldn't bear to look at any of them in the, in the face, especially the woman. And these were all people that Jesus had come into the world to sacrifice his life for, people he had come to love and serve so that they might know the one true God, the God that they claimed to honor and worship but, but didn't, that they would know that God is a God of tenderness and mercy and love not, and forgiveness, not fear. Yeah, it's obvious here to Jesus that uh, they neither wanted nor understood their need to know the true God. So what they were doing to this woman, what they were doing to him was so diametrically opposed to the heart of God. What he was, what Jesus' heart was all about was to love and forgive. What these guys were all about was to kill and destroy. And so Jesus' heart could hardly bear what was going on. It might be. The law of Moses is very clear. If a man and woman are caught in the act of adultery, the punishment is death. The only variable is how the death might be carried out. In this particular verse that they quoted from uh, the Mosaic law, it was to be carried out by stoning. But whatever the method, the, it would be brutal. It would be very public. It would be humiliating. So Leviticus 20.10 says, if a man commits adultery with another man's wife, both the man and the woman must be put to death. But there's no guy here, and we'll talk about that, why that may be. Leviticus 20 is not a fun read. A lot of Leviticus is not a fun read. Uh, but this was the law. This was the law the woman's accusers were following. In certain cases, when a man and woman were caught in adultery, uh, the man was made to stand in a pile of dung. If you read Leviticus, this is what it says. This is the Bible. And they would tie a rope around his neck, and one guy would stand over here, and one guy would stand over there, and they would both pull. Uh, what a humiliating uh, way to die. It's, it's an interesting note, though, that this woman came out by herself, because last, you know, they say it takes two to tango, and uh, only this woman is brought before Jesus. Most likely, because whoever she was with, whoever that guy was, uh, was part of the conspiracy to catch her in adultery and set Jesus up. And the good news for all of us is that Jesus didn't come to perpetuate this religion of the Pharisees. He came to establish a new covenant with anyone who would believe him and follow him and sacrifice their life to him, offer their life to him. He came to establish a covenant of grace, a covenant of forgiveness, a covenant of hope, extended specifically to notorious sinners like you and like me. And at first, these religious leaders are frustrated, and they're probably offended because Jesus didn't answer them on their timetable. And now he's stooping in the ground and writing in the dirt rather than giving them their answer. So verse 6b and 7 says, Jesus stooped down and wrote in the dust with his finger. They kept demanding an answer, and Jesus kept writing. I love that. What do you think? I'll get back to you in a second. I'm just going to write this thing and this, and then we can talk more. What I find uh, incredibly sad is that these accusers are the most religious people in their society. They're, they are the ones that are supposed to be leading others towards God. But they didn't. In this religious culture, they claimed that was founded on God and ultimately reflected the heart of God had absolutely nothing to do with God and God had absolutely nothing to do with it. 
The Pharisees used their power in this religious culture, this religious system to uh, judge and condemn people. And in sharp contrast, Jesus uses his power to love and forgive and redeem people. Uh, if you know me, you know that I will talk to anybody um, at any time about any nonsensical thing. So my wife used to tell me, it's like you have a flashing sign above your head. Talk to me. Talk to me. So if I'm getting a haircut, I'm definitely not the guy praying that the person cutting my hair won't talk to me. You know? I'm like, hey, what's up? What are you doing? How long, what, are your, what are your hours today? And then we, you know, if I'm at Starbucks you know, working or whatever, I will talk to the people there. Um, I definitely, um, we were on vacation uh, in April down in, in uh, California around the San Clemente Pier, and there were all these people looking over the edge. I may have told you this, but they're looking over the edge, and I walked over, and my daughter's like, Dad, don't, don't, don't go. <laughs> so I went anyway, and I, I looked over like everybody else was, and I said, what are you guys looking at? There's nothing down there. And my kids are like, Dad. And uh, they, they're like, there's a shark. There's a shark down there. I'm like, no, there is. Oh, and then this. 10 foot or so shark came out from under and scared my kids. Um, so uh, what I know from talking to people, what I know from hanging out with people who, uh, hanging out a lot with people who don't uh, know Jesus is that they're definitely, they want something more. They are crying out, show me what I'm looking for. Um, and they're also more open to Jesus than we might think. It's not necessarily Jesus they have the problem with, it's the church. They don't trust the church. They don't trust religion. They will sit and talk to us, you and I, um, about Jesus. They'll sit and talk to us you know, at work or you know, in the backyard around a fire pit. They'll talk to us about Jesus, but they won't come to church, at least not immediately. And in a lot of cases, uh, not for a while, if ever. And the God-shaped vacuum in their life is obvious. They long for mercy. They long for grace. They long for forgiveness. They long for the aching in their soul and the emptiness in their soul to be soothed and filled, but they can't even identify that their soul is empty. Yet for any number of reasons, the last place they think that they'll have a profound encounter with Jesus is right here in the church. People see the church, people who don't know Jesus, many of them, see the church as, the Pharise as we see the Pharisees, as we see the religious leaders in this story. They need Jesus desperately, which means they need to see a uh, reflection of Jesus in us. They need, need to see our hearts caring for them in, in a real way, loving them in real ways. They need to see that there's actually hope in our lives, even if our circumstances don't call for hope. So the Pharisees are now growing really impatient with Jesus. They're demanding an answer from him. And so Jesus, in his infinite wisdom, uses the law of the Pharisees, the law that they're so zealous for, to put the ball back in their court. Uh-oh, the plan that they spent all night working out might not work out. He puts the burden for killing this woman squarely back on their shoulders. Verse 6, so he stood up again and said, all right, stone her. Let those who have never sinned throw the first stones. Then he stooped down again and wrote in the dust. And we don't know what he wrote in the dust. Jesus knew that the law of Moses, uh, he actually he knew the law of Moses better than any and all of these guys put together. And so he quotes part of Deuteronomy 17. The whole of Deuteronomy 17, 6 and 7 says this, Never put a person to death on the testimony of only one witness. There must always be at least two or three witnesses. The witnesses must throw the first stone. So you better be really sure of what your, that your accusations are correct. Jesus gives them an answer and he stoops down and writes in the ground again. Imagine the agony of the woman who's waiting for her fate to unfold as Jesus is writing in the dirt and these guys are yelling at Jesus for an answer and she's just waiting to die. Is it possible for Jesus, is it possible for this one guy that she's heard about but never thought most likely that, she, that he would ever care about somebody like her. Could he possibly save her? Imagine the guilt and shame she must have been carrying. And my guess is that she carried a heavy burden of guilt and shame and regret around with her wherever she went long before this moment, long before this day. 
And it's very likely that the choices and circumstances of her life had delivered a death blow to her soul. And her soul is maybe not, it's not totally dead because she's still breathing, but it's on life support. And it had been long before this day, long before this encounter with Jesus. And many of us have been there. And many of us, maybe we may not, may not say it to anybody else, but we're there right now. We may not be guilty of being caught in the very act of adultery, but there's stuff in our life, whether it's current stuff or past stuff, that has delivered a death blow to our souls, and our souls at best now are on life support. Life and the circumstances of life our present, our past, the combination of both, they've robbed us of a sense of real hope. I dare to hope just a little bit, but I dare not hope more than that because I'll just be disappointed, I'll just be hurt again. And we can't, what we need is to be forgiven, to know that Jesus is a a tender uh, God, that he pursues us with relentless tenderness, that he forgives us for all of our sins. Psalm 103 was read. He doesn't treat us the way our sins deserve. We can't li- keep living the way that a lot of us are living with this shame and guilt and regret. We've got to put the burden down somehow. We've got to free up our souls to experience what Jesus longs for us to experience. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, Jesus says, hey, those of you with, uh, who are tired and carry heavy burdens, Come to me and I will give you rest. In other words, we can come and lay down our heavy burdens at Jesus' feet because they are forgiven. They are not ours to carry anymore. How many of us desperately need to do that? Some of us, maybe many of us, that's why we're here today. It's maybe not why we came, but it's why we're here. To lay our burden down so that we can receive what we desperately need from Jesus. Forgiveness, hope, whatever it is. So Jesus tells the Pharisees, go ahead, stone this woman. Just as long as uh, the one of you, or the ones of you who don't have any sin, throw the first stones. And at that point it becomes clear to Jesus' accusers uh, just what Jesus was writing on the ground, even though we don't know. It's also occurring to them right now that their awesome plan has fallen apart totally. Some scholars think that Jesus was writing the law of Moses on the, on the ground. Uh, possible, but not likely, because if he was writing the law of Moses on the ground, it could have emboldened these guys. Could, they could have said, yeah, see, that's right, and wanted, they would want to continue to pursue killing this woman. It's most likely that Jesus was writing, I shouldn't say it's most likely because we don't know. I like the fact that it could have been that Jesus was writing down the specific sins of each of the accusers. This is the most popular view on this. The specific sins of everybody. So how ironic, they pull this lady out of whatever house she was in and say, she was caught in the very act of adultery and now Jesus is writing, they humiliate her, right, in front of everybody and now Jesus is writing their sins on the ground. That sounds like, seems like something Jesus might actually do. It's a fascinating and very effective strategy on Jesus' part if that's what he, that's what he did. How does he know what their sins are? The Pharisees were like the best at um, projecting an image of religiosity, religiousness, whatever, and uh, piety. They They had phenomenal facades that you couldn't crack. Just like many of us, we have a great facade. We've been working on it for years and years, and we project an image of everything is great in our lives when it's not. We project an image of, oh, God is good. The first, first service, we did this thing where uh, the worship leader said, God is good, and everybody said, all the time. I'm, I'm like, are we just doing that because we're in church? Because I wonder how many of us really feel that God is good. I wonder how many of us really know what we're experiencing right now that God is good. We're just kind of throwing out words because we're in church. When Jesus says, let the one among you without sin cast the first stone, he's not simply talking about sin in general. It could have been translated this way. Let the one of you who has never committed adultery or never thought of committing adultery cast the first stone. It was all guys in this uh, group of accusers. They were all guilty. So in Matthew 5, 28, 
Jesus said, I say anyone who even looks at a woman with lust in his eye has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And so one by one, the accusers slip away, starting with the oldest, those who had been guilty the longest. And Jesus had made them realize their, that the one fatal flaw of their religion, not only, not only were they attempting to hold this woman to standards uh, of the law, they were trying to keep her to standards they themselves couldn't keep, and they wanted to kill her for it. And sadly, this is still one of the greatest tragedies in the church. We condemn others because they don't live up to, strat uh, to behaviors or to standards that we ourselves don't live up to. We are all broken people, just like the woman here. Yet for some reason, revealing our brokenness and revealing our pain, revealing to people what we're really going through is the last thing so many of us want to do. And we don't feel the freedom to, do, to share what's really going on in our lives with the people in this very room. So we don't. We keep the mask on. We project whatever we think people expect us to project. We don't share what's really going on because we're afraid to share. We're afraid of being judged. We're afraid of being gossiped about. And then we're afraid of being ostracized. And so we just keep it to ourselves. Imagine, though, you're gathered with with your people, people that you really trust, and you're talking about, or I'm, let's make it me, I'm gathered with a bunch of friends, and uh, I start talking about so-and-so, hey, can you believe this, or do you, and the person I'm talking to is not somebody that I've taken the time to get to know. It, their circumstances, certainly, I don't know anything about other than what you can see on the surface, but yet I'm totally willing to shred them, right? And then what would happen if one of my friends started uh, writing down all my sins or started speaking all of my, my sins, I would quickly shut up, you know? I would quickly stop talking. In an instant, I would be exposed, and my mask and my facade that I worked so hard to craft for so many years would fall to my feet and shatter into a thousand pieces. If that happened to, to me or to you, we'd be exposed for who we really are, broken, inconsistent, flawed, Sinful people who desperately need Jesus every day. This, as scary uh, and humiliating as that scenario is for somebody to list out all our sins, the things that we try so desperately to keep from each other, there's, uh, it could be so liberating to do that, just to be free of that. The Pharisees in John 8 uh, were not the Holy Spirit for this woman caught in adultery. They were in no position to judge her. They were in their religious system, but not in God's system, not in the human system. They weren't in a position to judge her. You and I are not the Holy Spirit for other people in this room. It's not our position to judge other people. And when we do, we simply condemn ourselves. Jesus has something to say about a log and a splinter uh, in Matthew 7. So James 5.16 says, hey, James says, just... Just say it. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. James is saying here, if we're to live openly and honestly with each other, owning our brokenness, struggling with our stuff together, sharing it with each other, helping each other so that we might experience love and forgiveness in this place, but also experience God's love and God's forgiveness and the strength that his Holy Spirit infuses into our lives. That would be the church of my dreams, man. If we could all just stop pretending for a little while. For a long while. And just be who we really are. What would happen? Oh, I'd go find another church. That would be sad. Don't do that. It could be so liberating just to be honest. You know? It could be so much more effective. So many more people would be attracted to um, this place because they're attracted to us. Because they see something in those of us who call ourselves Christians that they can identify with. Brokenness. Inconsistency. And in the midst of that, some hope that they long for. 
So finally, this woman is left alone with Jesus along with the crowd that was still there, the group that originally had come to listen to Jesus teach. And here's where the beautiful interaction takes place. Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. Then Jesus said, uh, stood up again and said to her, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus answered, neither do I. Go and sin no more. What an encounter this was. Two seconds before this, this woman is thinking she's going to die. That's, rocks are going to start flying at her head. Now she's been, giving, been given, uh, well, she's had an encounter that she never dreamed she could have. And she's been forgiven of things she's never dreamed she could be forgiven of. And she has life to live with this newfound hope, this newfound experience, this newfound forgiveness. As long as you and I, I mean, we could be a second like this woman was from getting stoned uh, with rocks. Uh, as long as we have breath in our, in our lungs, we're never without hope. God has an unlimited supply of hope, and he offers it to the most broken among us. There's no three-strike rule with God. You know what? Are you back again? This is your third, second time. You come back one more time, you're out of here. That's not how God treats us. He even offers hope to the most uh, serial repeat offenders among us, you know, those of us who are constantly screwing things up. God is constantly forgiving us. He offers us hope, even in the most difficult circumstances, even when our circumstances don't call for it. He's offering us hope today. How badly and desperately do you need hope in your life? And will you... And will I uh, dare ask God to give it to us? Some of us, if not many of us in the room, are in the same state as this woman was. We, are, uh, we feel guilty and we're regularly without uh, hope. Our hearts and souls are being crushed under the weight of fear and guilt and shame and anxiety. We're exhausted because of it, both spiritually and emotionally. Jesus longs to breathe life back into our souls, to breathe and speak forgiveness back into our hearts. So let the words of hope that Jesus spoke to this woman, whose name we, you and I will never know, but whose name Jesus would never forget, let his words wash over you and me, and let, let them wash over us in, in this moment. Where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said, then neither do I condemn you. This is from the NIV, Jesus declared, Go now and leave your life of sin. There's so much more for you and I to live for. There's so much more life for you and I to live than the lives we've settled for, the lives we've been comfortable for or comfortable with. May we not be people who settle with less than all God desires to give us, less than all that God created to give us. Let Jesus breathe hope into your soul. Well, let's not wait another day. Let's not waste another day. We're going to take uh, communion. And this is a great opportunity just to come uh, and take the elements that represent the life of Jesus, that represent the sacrifice of Jesus, and uh, recognize the profound love and the extraordinary grace that Jesus had for this woman and recognize that he has it for you too in abundance. Let's pray. Oh, before I pray, let me just remind you that ta table in the back, it has cups for those of you who uh, don't like to do the dipping thing. That, if you like the cups, there you go. Uh, Gluten-free also. And I think every table has gluten-free, but that one is a special table back there for you. So now that we know that, um, those of you who like to go the sanitary way, that's, the, that's for you. Let's pray. God, may we be people who, as we come to the table, uh, realize that your love, a love that stood up to um, religious leaders, cultural leaders, uh, a love that saved the life of a woman, the love that saves our lives. May we... Um, have a deeper sense, the deepest possible sense of what that love is. And 
how desperately you pursue us with it and how, uh, how your heart aches over our unwillingness to fully embrace that relentlessly tender love and to be fully embraced by you. May we be people who realize that we are forgiven no matter what we've done, no matter where we've been, no matter how many times we've needed to be forgiven. May we be people who, uh, for the first time, or start all over again, living in close proximity to you. Close enough so that you can touch us. Close enough so that you can heal us. Heal our broken, the broken places in our life and, and alter the trajectory of our lives. God, don't let us be people who settle for just where we're at. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. To close, I want to end with the doxology from the letter of Jude. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Thank you for coming. Go in peace.